Live from Las Vegas, it's The Cube. Covering HPE Discover 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for day two of three days of exclusive coverage from The Cube here at HPE Discover 2017. Our two next guests is Bill Menel, VP and General Manager of HPC and AI for HPE. Feel great to see you. And Dr. Nick Nystrom, Senior Director of Research at Pittsburgh's Supercomputer Center. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Appreciate well, thank it. You. Thank you, my As pleasure. we wrap up day two, uh, first of all, before we get started, love the AI, love the high performance computing. We're seeing great applications for compute. Everyone's now, now sees that a lot of compute actually is good, right? So that's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. What is uh, the Pittsburgh um, Hype Supercomputer Center? Give a quick update on, on what, and describe what that is. Sure, uh, the quick update is we're operating a system called Bridges. Bridges is operated for the National Science Foundation. It democratizes HPC. It brings people who have never used high-performance computing before to be able to use HPC seamlessly, almost as a cloud. It unifies HPC, big data, and artificial intelligence. So who are some of the users that are, that are getting access that they didn't have before? Can you just kind of talk about some of the use cases of the, of, the, of the organizations or people that you guys are opening this up to? Sure, um, I think one of the new communities that's very significant is deep learning. So we have collaborations between the University of Pittsburgh, Life Sciences, mm -hmm. and the Medical Center with Carnegie Mellon, machine learning researchers, where we're looking to apply AI, machine learning, to problems in breast and lung cancer. Yeah, we're seeing the data. Talk about some of the innovations that HPE's bringing you, with you guys in the partnership, because we're seeing, you know, people are seeing the results of using big data and deep learning in breakthroughs. That, weren't possible before. So not only do you have the democratization cool element happening, mm -hmm. you have a tsunami of awesome open source code coming in from, from big places. You see Google donating a bunch of, mm -hmm. bunch of uh, machine learning libraries. Everyone's donating code. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like open bar and open source, as I say. And the, the young kids are, that are new to are, are the innovators as well. So not just the, the, us systems guys, but a lot of young developers are coming in. What's the, what's the innovation? Why is this happening? What's the, what's the aha moment? Is it just cloud? Is it a combination of things? Well, talk I think about. it's a combination of all the big data coming in and then new techniques that allow us to analyze and get value from it from that standpoint. So, so in the traditional HPC world, typically we built equations which then generated data. Now we're actually kind of doing the reverse, which is we take the data and then build equations to understand the data. So it's a different paradigm and so there's more and more energy understanding those two different techniques of kind of getting to the same answers but in a different way. So Bill, mm -hmm. you and I talked in London yes. last year with Dr. Go. Yes. And we talked a lot about SGI and what that you know, acquisition meant to you guys. So I wonder if you could give us a quick update on the business. I mean, it's doing very well. Meg talked yes. about it on the conference call this, yes. this last, last quarter. Really high point and growing. What's driving the growth? And give us an update on the business. Sure, and I think the thing that's driving the growth is all this data and the fact that, that customers want to get value from it. So we're seeing a lot of growth in industries like financial services, like in manufacturing, where folks are moving to digitization, which means that in the past they might have done a lot of their work through experimentation. Now they're moving it to a digital format and they're simulating everything. Um, so that's driven a lot more HPC over time. As far as the SGI, integration is, uh, is concerned. We've, we've integrated about halfway, so we're at about the halfway point, and now we've got uh, the engineering teams together, and we're driving a roadmap and a, and a new set of products that are coming out. Our Gen 10 based products are, are on target, and they're going to be releasing here over the next few months. So, so Nick, from your standpoint, I mean, when you look at the, there's been an ebb and flow in the supercomputer landscape mm -hmm. for decades, you know, right back to the 70s and the 80s. So, from a customer perspective, you know, what do you see now? Um, obviously China is much more prominent mm -hmm. you know, in the game. Um, it's sort of an arms race, if you will, in, in computing power. Um, from a customer's perspective, what are you seeing? What are you looking for in, in a supplier? Well, so I agree with you. There is this arms race for exaflops. Where we are really focused right now is enabling data intensive applications looking at big data as a service, HPC as a service, really making things available to users to be able to draw on the large data sets you mentioned, to be able to put the capability class computing, which will go to Exascale, 
together with AI and uh, data analytics under one platform, under one integrated fabric, that's what we did with HPE for Bridges, and looking to build on that in the future to be able to do the, the exascale applications that you're referring to, but also to couple on data and to be able to use AI with classic simulation to make those simulations better. So it's always good to have a you know, true practitioner uh, on theCUBE, but when you talk about you know, AI and machine learning and deep learning, John and I, John and I sometimes joke, is it, is it same wine, new bottle? <laughs> or is there really some fundamental shift going on that just sort of happened to emerge in the last you know, six to nine months? I think there is a fundamental shift. And the shift is due to what Bill mentioned. It's the availability of data. So we have that. We have more and more communities who are building on that. You mentioned the open source frameworks. So yes, they're building on the TensorFlows, on the cafes. And we have people who have not been programmers they're using these frameworks, though, and using that to drive insights from data they now have access to. So they're flipped upside down. I mean, this is their point. I mean, Bill pointed it out. It's like the models are upside down. Mm -hmm. This <laughs> is this is the new world. I mean, it's crazy. So if that's yep. the case, and I believe it, um, it, it feels like we're entering this new wave of innovation. Which, for decades, you know, we talk about uh, how how we marched to the to the cadence of Moore's law. Mm -hmm. That's been the innovation. You think back, you know your five megabyte disk drive, and then it went to 10, <laughs> and then 20 and 30, and now it's four terabytes, okay, wow. Compared to what we're about to see, mm -hmm. I mean, it pales in comparison. So help us envision what the world is going to look like in, <coughs> in 10 or 20 years, and I know it's you know, hard to do that, but can, we, can you help us get our minds around the potential uh, that this industry is going to tap? So I think, first of all, I think the potential of AI is very hard to predict, uh, we see that. What we demonstrated in Pittsburgh with the victory of Labradas, the poker playing bot mm -hmm. over the world's best humans, is the ability of an AI to beat humans in a situation where they have incomplete information, where you have an antagonist, an adversary who is bluffing, who is reacting to you, and who, is, who you have to deal with. And I think that's a real breakthrough. We're going to see that move into other aspects of life. It will be buried in apps, it will be transparent to a lot of us, but those sorts of AIs are going to influence a lot. That's going to take a lot of IT on the back end for the infrastructure, because these will, be, these will continue to be compute hungry. So I always use the example of Kasparov, and mm -hmm. he got beaten by the machine, and then mm -hmm. he started a competition to team up with a supercomputer and yep. beat the machine. Yeah, humans <laughs> and machines beat machines. Uh, do you expect that's going to continue? Maybe both your opinions. I mean, this is we're sort of spitballing here, but will that augmentation continue for you know, in, in a <laughs> definite period of time, or, or are we going to see the day that you well, know, I think, well, it doesn't I think happen? Over time, you'll you'll continue to see progress, and you'll continue to see more, more and more regular type of symmetric type workloads being done by machines, and that allows us to do, the, you know, the really complicated things that that uh, mm -hmm. you know, the human brain is, is able to better process than perhaps a machine, a machine brain, if you will. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's exciting from the standpoint of being able to, to, to take some of those other, yeah. other roles and so forth and, and be able to get those done in, in perhaps a more efficient manner than we're able to do. Mm -hmm. Bill, Bill, Nick, talk a bit about, I want to get your reaction to the, the concept of data. As data evolves, you're talking about the models. I like the way you're going with that because if things are being flipped around. The old days, I want to monetize my data. I have data sets, people look at their data. I'm going to make money from my data. So people would talk about how we monetizing old the days, data. Old days, like two years ago. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, people actually try to solve and monetize their data, and that could be use case for one piece of it. Other people are saying, no, I'm going to open and make people own their own data, make it shareable, make it more of an uh, uh, enabling mm -hmm. opportunity or creating uh, opportunities mm -hmm. to monetize differently, sure. a different shift. That really comes down to the insights question. What's your, what trends do you guys see emerging where data is much more of a fabric, it's less of a you know, discrete, monetizable asset, but more of an enabling asset? Where, what's your vision on the role of data? As developers start weaving in some of these insights, you mentioned the AI mm -hmm. piece, I think that's right on. I, what's, your, what's your reaction to the role of data, the value of the data, well, I think one thing that, that we're seeing in some of our, especially our big industrial customers, is the fact that they really want to be able to, to share that data together and collect it in one place. 
and then have that regularly updated. So if you look at a big aircraft manufacturer, for example, they actually are putting sensors all over their aircraft and in real time bringing data down and putting it into a, a, a place where now as they're doing new designs, they can access that data and use that data as a way of making design trade-offs and design decisions. So a lot of customers that I talk to in the industrial area are really trying to capitalize on all the data possible to allow them to, to bring, bring new insights in, to, to predict things like future failures, to figure out how they need to maintain uh, whatever they have in the field and those sorts of things at all. So it's, so it's uh, uh, just kind of keeping it within the enterprise itself. I mean, that's a challenge, a really big challenge, just to get data collected in one place and be able to efficiently use it just within an enterprise. We're not even talking about sort of pan enterprise, but just within the enterprise. That is a significant change that we're seeing, actually an effort to actually do that and see the value. And the high performance computing really highlights some of these nuggets that are coming out if you just throw compute at something, if you set it up and wrangle it, you're going to get these insights, I mean, new, new opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. What's your vision, Nick? How do you see the data, and how do you talk to your peers and people who are generally curious on how to approach it, how to architect data modeling, and how to think about it? Yeah, I, I think one of the clearest examples on managing that sort of data comes from the life sciences. So we're working with researchers at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and the Institute for Precision Medicine at Pitt Cancer Center. And there, it's mayor bringing together the very large data as Bill alluded to, but there it's very disparate data. It is genomic data. It is individual tumor data from individual patients across their lifetime. It is imaging data. It's electronic health records. And trying to be able to do this sort of AI on that to be able to deliver true precision medicine, to be able to say that for a given tumor type, we can look into that and yeah. give you the right therapy or even more interestingly, how can we prevent some of these issues proactively? Dr. Nystrom, they're, they're, it's expensive doing what you, what you do. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a commercial a, a opportunity at the end of the rainbow here for you, or is that taboo? I mean, is that a it, good thing? No, thank you, it, it's both. So as a national supercomputing center, our resources are absolutely free for open research. Mm -hmm. That's a good use of our taxpayer dollars. They've, they've funded these, we've worked with HP, we've designed the system that's great for everybody. We also can make this available to industry at an extremely low rate because it is a federal resource. We, we do not make a profit on that. And so, but looking forward, we are working with local industry to let them test things, to try out ideas, especially in AI, where they haven't, they, they, a lot of people want to do AI, they don't know what to do. And so we can help them. We can help them architect solutions, put things on hardware, and when they determine what works, then they can scale that up, either locally on-prem or with us. This is a great digital resource. You think about, you talk about the federal funded. I mean, you can look at Yosemite, it's a state park. You know, these are the Yellowstone, these are, these are natural resources. But now when you start thinking about the goodness that's being funded, mm -hmm. you're talking about democratization, mm -hmm. medicine's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. This is an, an interesting model as we move forward. We see what's going on in government, <laughs> and seeing how things are instrumented, some's not. Um, delivery of drugs and, and medical care, all these mm -hmm. things are coalescing. How do you see this digital age extending? Because if this continues, we should be doing more of these, right? We should be, <laughs> I mean, we need to be. It makes sense, so, so is there, I mean, I'm just not to speed on what's going on with, with the with well, federally funded. Thing, yeah, I think one thing that uh, uh, Pittsburgh has done with, uh, with the Bridges machine is, is really try to bring in data and compute and all the different types of disciplines in there and provide a, a place where a lot of people can learn, they can build applications and things like that. That's really unusual in HPC. A lot of times HPC is around big iron. Yeah. People want to have the biggest iron basically on the top 500 list. This is where the focus hasn't been on that. This yeah. is the focus where the focus has been on uh, really creating value through the data and, and getting people to, yeah. to, to utilize it and then build more applications. You know, I'll make an observation. Um, when we first started doing the cube, we observed that we talked about big data, and we said that the practitioners of big data are where the guys are going to make all the money. And mm -hmm. it's so far that's proven true. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at the public big data mm -hmm. companies, and none of them are making any money. And maybe this was sort of true with with ERP, but but not like it is with big data. It feels like AI is going to be similar. That the the consumers of AI, those people that can find insights from that that data, are, are really where the the big money mm -hmm. is, is going to be made here. 
I don't know. It just feels you mean like a long. Way. You mean a long tail of value creation? Yeah. In other words, you know, you used to see in the computing industry, it was Microsoft and Intel. You know, became you know trillion dollar value companies, and maybe there's a couple of others, but but it it really seems to be the the folks that are absorbing those technologies, applying them, solving problems. You know, whether it's healthcare or logistics, transportation, et cetera. Or, or looks to where the huge economic opportunities may be. I don't know if you guys well, have I think, thought about um, that. Or? Well, I think that's happened a little bit in big data. So if you look at uh, sure. what the financial services Absolutely. market has done, they, they probably benefited far more than the, than the companies that m make the solutions because now they understand what their consumers want, they, they can better predict their, their life yeah, insurance. Right. How and you can make that argument for Facebook, for sure. Uh, absolutely, it, from that perspective. You know, so, um, so I yeah, expect the same thing to your point around AI as well. So the folks that really use it, use it well will probably be the ones that benefit yeah. from because it. Because the tooling mm -hmm. is very important. And that's you got to make the application, that's the end, end state in all mm -hmm. this. That's the <laughs> rubber meets the road. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. All right, so final question. What are you guys showing here at Discover? What's the big uh, HPC? What's the story? For you guys? Um, so we're actually showing our, our Gen 10 product. Um, so this is with the latest, the latest uh, microprocessors in all of our Apollo lines. So these are specifically optimized platforms for HPC and now also artificial intelligence. We have a platform called the Apollo 6500, which is used by a lot of companies to do AI work. So it's a very dense GPU platform and, and does uh, a lot of processing in, thing, in terms of video, audio, these types of things that are used a lot in, in some of the workflows around AI. Great, Nick, anything spectacular for you here that you're interested in? Um, so what we did show here, we had video in Meg's um, opening session, right. and that was showing the poker result. And yeah. I think that was really significant because it was actually a great amount of computing. It was 19 million core hours. So it was an HPC yeah. AI application, and. I think that was really interesting, it was a success. The unperfect information, really, we talked about this earlier in our last segment with, the, with, with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. It's really what it amplifies the unstructured data world, right? People mm -hmm. trying to solve the streaming problem with all this velocity, you can't get everything, so you need yes. to use machines mm -hmm. right. to, otherwise you have a, a haystack of needles, <laughs> instead of trying to find the needles in the haystack, right. <laughs> as they were saying. Um, Okay, my final question for just curious on this natural, re I'm not, federal resource, <laughs> natural yes. resource, feels like it. Is there like a line to get in? I mean, I go to the park and there's camp waiting list, I got to get in there early. How do you guys handle the flow for access to the supercomputer center? Is it, uh, my uncle works there, I know a friend of a friend, <laughs> uh, is it a reservation <laughs> system? I mean, I mean, who yeah, gets well, access to this awesomeness? So there's a peer reviewed system, it's fair. Uh, people apply for large allocations four times a year. This goes to a national committee. They met this past Sunday and Monday for the most recent. They evaluate the proposals based on merit and they make awards accordingly. We make 90% of the system available through that means. We have 10% discretionary that we can make available to the corporate sector and to others who are doing proprietary research in data intensive computing. Is there a duration when you go through the application process, minimums and kind of like commitments is to get involved for the folks so, who might be interested in, in and hitting you up. For academic research, the normal award is one year. These are renewable. People can extend these, and they do. What we see now is, of course, for large data resources, yeah. people keep those going. The AI knowledge base is 2.6 petabytes. That's a lot. Yeah. For industrial engagements, those could be of any length. Any startup action coming in is just more bigger, more. Yeah. A absolutely. A coworker <laughs> of mine has been very active in life sciences startups yeah. in Pittsburgh and engaging many of these. We have meetings every week with them now, it seems, yeah. and with other sectors, because that is such a yeah. great opportunity. Well, congratulations, it's fantastic work, and uh, we're happy to promote it and get the word out. Good, good to see HP evolve as well. Thanks yeah, for, for sharing, and again, congratulations. Good, good work, guys. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, what a you. great way to end the day here, democratizing supercomputing, bringing high-performance computing. Mm -hmm. That's what the cloud's all about. That's what great software's out there with AI. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, bringing you all the data here from HP, eDiscover 2017. Stay tuned for more live action after this short break.